Uh, let's talk to Rafe Hadel Manku. Hello, Rafe. Hello, Mike. Very well done. Um, thank you very much indeed. I don't know what it is about Wokeby that annoys me so much, but he really does irritate me. He is the epitome, I think, of the sort of champagne socialist class of people in this country who think they know better than everybody else, who detest the Tories, who detest what they think of as right-wingers, and who have no idea what is wrong with this country. And it's them. Exactly. It's, um, it's telling that the other peers to support him in this were all Lib Dem and Labour peers, because, you know, for many generations it was very much the case that the Church of England was the Tory party at prayer. Yes. Uh, but it's long ceased to hold Not that. anymore. Or I should say, actually, it's still the case for the congregations. But when it comes to the Church of England leadership, it's very much the Green Party at prayer, or the Corbynistas at prayer, or even <laughs> Black Lives Matter at prayer. Yes. Um, and this is one of the problems, because actually the Church of England bishops are the most elite and privileged group in society. You know, if you listen to the our cabinet, they sound very different to the cabinets of Margaret Thatcher, for example. Yes. You don't get RP pronunciations increasingly in our military and so forth. But when you listen to the to the uh, archbishops in in Parliament and in and in the cathedrals, it still is very much the very definition of elitism. Yes. But it's the new elitism, if I can quote Matthew Goodwin. It is very but, much. Is that right up Matt Goodwin's street? It really is. Because isn't it ironic that here we have one of the most ethnically diverse governments I think that Britain has ever had, and yet they're constantly being accused of racism. By an overwhelmingly white yes. uh, Church of England hierarchy, yes. who are overwhelmingly drawn from a single class, most of whom, I think, I think every bishop perhaps, I think is correct to say that they are all privately educated. Mm. And this comes at a time when the gap between the clergy and the laity grows ever wider, because the majority of people who take up the pews in Anglican churches, they voted for Brexit, they're in favour of strict limits on migration, they want to clamp down on the small boats coming over, and they hold generally socially conservative views. And yet the archbishops and uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury and, and other bishops, it's fine to use the House of Lords for this purpose because we have an established church, but they also make the same comments from the pulpit. Mm. They've spoken out about the evils of capitalism, about the, they've condemned universal credit. They've spoken about uh, the, the Brexit being a mistake. Welby has said, you know, spoken of in the past about favoring uh, open borders. Now, no one is saying that the church shouldn't have positions. Of course it should. It's a moral institution. It should stand for an end to exploitation and injustice. But that's very different to actually criticizing specific policies of one party whilst adopting policies of another party or indeed, as we saw before with George Floyd, with Black Lives Matter. Yes. And that's what we have here. It's a complete refusal to understand the needs of their congregation, but also willingly or not, a refusal to understand that this illegal migration bill is about deterrence, it's about creating a truly hostile society, uh, environment. Yeah. And that's the only way you can stop people from coming. And by what by do-gooders like Wokeby like, like are just undermining that bill and all of the intentions, and they're going to make matters far worse by encouraging far greater numbers of people to come over here. Creating hostile mm. environments works. The example we can all look to is Denmark, where they have brought numbers of uh, illegal migrants down to levels not seen since the 1990s. How have they done that? Well, one of the critics of the Danish policy said they've made De De Denmark seem so unwelcome. The message is quite clear. Stay in Germany, stay in France, yes. stay anywhere, but don't come over here. That's what this bill intends to do. And Indeed, because at the end of the day, as I've said many times, the only way to stop the boats is to stop the attract attractiveness of Britain as a final destination for these people. You know, if they thought that they would get here and not be welcomed, not be put in a hotel, not be given free money and free food and the right to stay eventually, um, if they knew that that wasn't going to happen, they'd stop coming. Yes, well, a leading French politician said it's not rocket science. If you want people to stop coming to Britain, make Britain less attractive than France. Mm. And currently, you know, Britain is a is a uh, cakewalk when it comes to the black market uh, of, of uh, illegal employment. Uh, landlords aren't being asked to verify uh, people who are help being housed by them. Mm. Whereas in France, there are strict strict uh, clampdowns on people who are working illegally. Yeah. People know they can come here, disappear into the black economy and have not, not so bad a life working in restaurants and elsewhere. Yeah. We need to get tough on this sort of stuff. As I said, Denmark did it so well. Denmark even took ads out, mm. papers in the Middle East, saying don't come here. Right. And if you arrive in Denmark and you've got over a thousand uh, euros worth of uh, 
items on you. Those will be confiscated yeah. and used to help house you and, and look after you. And um, they've, they also cut benefits by 50%, and they're called integration benefits. You know, these are, there are clear policies which are very easy to implement, which could be done. But when you get people like Welby speaking out, it undermines the entire... Yes atmosphere we're trying to create which is and imagine also people. him ab absolutely sort of uh, quoting the echr the european court of human rights or the european convention of human rights which we don't have to absolutely slavishly follow it's a recommendation they make rather than anything else and there's plenty of other european countries that completely ignore them yeah well D denmark as i said has been hauled before the european court on on many occasions uh, but what's it m most interesting is that there's complete unity in denmark between left-wing and right-wing governments in fact, the most draconian policies have been implemented by the left-wing government of Denmark. They were the first ones to actually consider relocating people to Africa mm. a year before we did it yeah. in this country. Well, I don't hear that being condemned. I mean, it Wokeby thinks, yeah, it, it be thinks Rwanda's a bad idea. Well, the UN doesn't. The United Nations have re, uh, replenished people to Rwanda many times, uh, as has uh, Syria, as has several other countries in, uh, in the world who are under the auspices of the ECHR. Um, so the idea that Rwanda is somehow not a suitable place for refugees is entirely wrong, because the United Nations thinks it's all right. But let's talk about another uh, big story this week but just before that Owen says this and this is a very good representation of my audience Archbishop Welby and his gang of priests live rent free with food on their plates whereas many people are struggling to live and paying taxes to accommodate illegal migrants at seven million pounds a day what is the Church of England doing to accommodate these illegal migrants in their rent free privileged lifestyle stop pontificating take off your regalia and act like a normal humble man who works hard to pay his bills I think that says it all doesn't it yes well Every bishop has a palace. What more can one, what well, more can one say? Well, quite. And, and everybody's uh, got a balcony. Well, not quite. But let's talk about uh, Adjira Ando, uh, who has had the most complaints made against her uh, to Ofcom because of what she said over the course of the weekend at the coronation coverage on ITV. Have a look. We've gone, we've gone from the, uh, the, uh, the rich diversity of the Abbey to a terribly white balcony. I'm very <laughs> struck by yes. that. I'm also looking at those younger generations and thinking, uh, what are the nuances that they will inhabit as they grow? Yeah, I'm looking at her and thinking, what the hell are you thinking? Um, the thing that I think I find most amusing about the clip is the sort of nervous laughter from the co-presenter of ITV, who doesn't seem to know quite how to react. Mylene Klass, however, uh, looks as horrified as I've ever seen her. This is the most complaints that have ever been made. I think more than 4,000 complaints to Ofcom uh, for, for, for saying what she said. Incredible, really, isn't it? I think she's a ghastly woman. It's not the first time she has said things like this. I've heard her on BBC Radio 4, actually, on a podcast recently, saying say much the same sort of incendiary, race-baiting stuff. Imagine if we were watching the coronation of uh, the King of Lesotho yeah. or of the King of, the, King of, the, of Swaziland and saying, oh, my gosh, this is a terribly black scene here. Yeah. Imagine the King of the Ashanti. Oh, my gosh, why is there no diversity here? Mm. Why is it this only happens one way? and in one direction. You know, I hate to break it to her, but Britain still is a majority white it British, is. British country. Yes. The overwhelming majority of this, of this country were behind the coronation. And it's a quite a perverted mind that that's the first thing that springs to your mind when you see this wonderful state occasion, this, 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 this scene we haven't had for 70 years of the king on the balcony with the royal family. Everybody in the crowd there celebrating and yeah. seeing how wonderful it is. And this woman is so down the rabbit hole of race grifting that the first thing she can think of is, is how white is this and it goes now to this it's almost and it's it's almost uh, a mental disease and many of the commentators on this issue that they are so obsessed that they can only see things now through race yes. race alone I know, because the sort of the slightly more remarkable thing is that she currently is playing uh, in a stage production of Richard the Third as Richard the Third. Uh, and as I said to somebody yesterday, yeah, great. She looks really like Richard III, um, so uh, that's obviously a great piece of casting. And the only reason for casting her as Richard III is to be r sort of, you know, edgy. Well, isn't it great? Let's get a black woman to play a former hunchbacked king. Brilliant. I'm looking forward to James Corden portraying Martin Luther King on the next uh, next Hollywood <laughs> epic that comes out. I mean, it really uh, is. It really is. And mad, it's really, it? it's really. You know, one of the things that's really telling. Whenever each episode, each new series of The Crown was coming out on Netflix, everybody would say, "Oh my gosh, what great cast! Look, Matt Smith looks just like Prince Philip. Mm. You know, Olivia Colman looks just like the Queen." All that attention being done to make sure that the characters look just like the people that they're representing. Um, suddenly, that all goes out of the window. 
and people turn a blind eye to all yes. that. When you have, for example, there was a play in the West End recently with Gore Vidal versus William F. Buckley Jr., right. two great heroes of mine. William F. Buckley Jr. was quite controversial in the civil rights movement. Yeah. He was played by, by a black actor, and I just thought, in what, what sense is this actually a reality? I know. <laughs> but, of course, all the people that you... If you complain about it, they say, oh, why do you care? But then if you said, as you say, if you said, well, I'll tell you what, let's portray then Nelson Mandela uh, as being played by Robert De Niro, they wouldn't fancy it. And they'd go, well, we can't do that. that. That would be appropriation. That would be nasty, horrible, nasty. Don't do it. But what it also does, you know, and actually a lot of people on the, on the other side of this argument actually agree, agree with us on this position because, in a sense, it gives this fantasy uh, uh, reality, this, this fantasy image that in the past all the cultures lived side by side in happy harmony and it actually undermines the civil rights movement when you see things like Bridgerton that, that this woman is also involved yes. in. Yes, which is the also a pile of rubbish to be honest. Yeah, with. but it gives the impression that you know in the 18th and 19th century everyone lived very happily side by side and it, 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 uh, it negates and undermines the struggles that people had to go through yeah. actually to get to today's current levels of equality. I know. I shall end it with this from uh, Pongo which is probably the tweet of the day. Is Archbishop Welby presenting match of the day this weekend he says. <laughs> well, he's qualified for it, isn't he? Obviously, because uh, he's woke. So that's what well, we, we want. Swap. I can see Lin I can see Lineker in the uh, in, in the pulpit very easily. Yeah, even I can he's see. Now the, yeah, the grand priest of woke, isn't with, he? With so. a mitre on his head and a, a shepherd's crook. Absolutely right. Leading his flock across the Red Sea as he parts it. Getting quite a spiritual today. Anyway, Rafe, good to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed, Rafe Hadel, main coup historian, broadcaster, and senior fellow.